hello, I'm Edward Lucas from SEPA. I'm in London at the moment, SEPA's in Washington, DC. And welcome to our discussion on a new abnormal, the shrinking space for free and independent media in Europe. We had originally planned this panel to discuss a new film about the Ukrainian journalist Georgi Gongadze, who was um, dis disappeared, I said, who was disappeared, kidnapped, abducted and killed um, on September the 16th, 2000. And there's a great new film, um, a documentary film, that's been produced by the Public Interest Journalism Lab in Kiev. And there's a link for that. And we shall be talking about Gongadze and his legacy and what's happened since. But of course, just in the last couple of days, we've had a real reminder of the shrinking space for free and independent media in Europe with the kidnapping of Roman Ratasevich, um, the Belarusian activist, blogger and journalist um, whose plane who was in a plane that was forced down, as I'm sure we all know, over um, Belarusian airspace on Sunday. And I'm sure many people who are watching our discussion here will have seen the horrific kind of hostage video that was produced um, uh, late uh, last night, bearing what looked to me like signs of beating as he came out with a very sort of wooden and implausible um, confession. And he's very much in our thoughts, as is the whole cause of independent um, media in, in Europe. So to discuss these um, difficult issues in this dark time, I'm joined by a really stellar panel. Um, first and foremost, N Natalia Gominyuk, who is the founder of the Public Interest Journalism Lab, a pillar of the free media in Kiev, and someone who's done a tremendous amount for press freedom, both in Ukraine and as, a, so as, as an example to copy um, for um, free media in, in the rest of the world. Welcome, Natalia. Um, we have um, Georg Ziegler, who's the deputy head of the support group for Ukraine, the European Commission, and he's standing in for our old friend Katarina Matanova, who is the deputy director, uh, deputy director general for European Neighbourhood and Enlargement Negotiations um, at the EU in Brussels, and has been a tremendous source of support, both for the um, accession pro countries and for the um, cause of media freedom and civil society more generally um, in those countries. Uh, we have Rastio Kuzel, who is the executive director of Memo 98, which is a media monitoring organization in Slovakia. And last but not least, we have Maria Saduska Komlak. She's the team leader for Europe and Eurasia at Free Press Unlimited, which is a Dutch NGO, but she's also a fellow at SEPA. So welcome to you all. We are going to discuss these issues by ourselves and we also look forward to questions from people who are watching us on the internet and you can just um, use the function in Zoom to post your question and we will um, answer them either singly or in groups. So first of all I'm going to go to you Natalia and ask you um, to, if you can to link together the case of Yuri Gongadze and of Roman, our kidnapped colleague, now languishing in a prison in um, in Minsk. What um, comes to your mind and how can we link these two phenomena? Thank you. Uh, Gungadze case for many people uh, considered as something uh, old, so like 20 years after his murder. We really understood that despite in, in that case, just shortly remind, Georgi Gungadze was a founder of one today most leading political papers, uh, Ukrainska Pravda. And when he was uh, kidnapped, he was beheaded by at that time active uh, um, general of the Ukrainian uh, Ministry of Interior. That was found way later. The investigation taken, you know, up to eight years, governments changed. Within the five years, uh, when there was still President Kuchma, there was a kind of cover up. So some of the things uh, we didn't know still. In the end, we have prosecutors uh, who are uh, you know, uh, some of them already served their term in prison. The person who killed Georgi Gangadze after eight years had been found and the man, the general of the Minister of Interior has been hiding in some way in Ukrainian villages. And to remember that Georgi Gangadze in the end had been buried 16 years after this uh, 
horrible, horrible crime. But despite that can be a bit of the positive case that there is at least an investigation and there is somebody uh, behind bars, within 20 years, the role of the president Kuchma uh, is, was not really ever investigated and with the time, Somehow it was forgotten. Mr. Kuchma was later the negotiation during the Minsk group um, in, in the conflict on, on the Donbas, one of the representative of the Ukrainian state. And uh, we really understood that that impunity, uh, that possible cover up uh, is something which allows other cases. So we, it's hard to imagine already now that this summer we would remember that it's already five years since the murder of another Ukrainska Pravda journalist, a Belarusian journalist, famous Belarus journalist Pavel Sheremet. Uh, and those cases, and we, when we are speaking about also Roman Protasevich today, are also unique in the way that it's often considered, and it's fair, that uh, the risks are especially uh, for the, you know, um, for the journalists who maybe are not that famous, that uh, there is not enough uh, attention to those cases. In case of Gongadze and Sheremet, and now in case of uh, Roman Protasevich, we see that that's cases where the first, in, in case of Gongadze and Roman Protasevich, we dis we're discussing the role of the presidents of the country. People know about these cases. Gongadze was a really famous journalist. Fa Pavel Shermet was the famous journalist. And uh, now uh, my, 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 my concern and uh, what worries me is that, of course, you think like if we knew, if, I don't know, the international authorities reacted fast, maybe there could be a different attention. If we pressure enough in the first stage of, uh, I don't know, of the uh, tragedy, uh, th something could be done. But what history shows that often if you really do not react immediately, uh, maybe after five or eight years, something would be investigated, but it doesn't help. It's, and something would be investigated when it's sometimes too late. Uh, so in, in, in what, what are the thoughts in my mind in these shocking days? is that it's very important to remember, it's very important not to forget the old cases, to look how, to learn from them, to look how similar they are to what's going on now. But we have this idea that maybe now some intervention uh, without hesitation can very, very rapid, can influence at least something. We probably couldn't save Georgi Gangadze. By the way, he warned in summer, 2000, that he is under surveillance and the government ignores it. So might he might be saved. We knew now that uh, some of our Ukrainian politicians at that time knew that there are some talks about him. So maybe that crime couldn't be stopped. Uh, now this case is just on, on all the headlines. And that is again the question, if this is a if the head of the state is involved, could we treat it differently? Could we forgive? Could we uh, avoid the trial or things like that? So these are my major, maybe, uh, let's say, connection. And I really hope that this reminding would be important for the, uh, of, of Gungadze case would, you know, a bit refresh us again that how, um, how important are those cases are for the building of the justice system in the country and how important they are for the development of the society and democracy, but also how it's important to react right away. Well, thank you so much uh, for that, Natalia, particularly for reminding us what a long and miserable history attacks on journalists have. I remember um, back in the 1990s, um, journalists being attacked, blown up, shot, and so on. And it's been um, the most dangerous place in the world at some time, some points for, for journalists, this sort of former, former Soviet space. And one of the things that leaps out at me is the need for what um, is in the jargon called soft target protection. And it really puzzled me, where was Greek counterintelligence? Didn't they notice at Athens airport that these goons were hanging around and apparently harassing um, uh, Roman as he got on the plane? Um, did they notice the passenger list had these KGB people on it? So is it really so hard to, to spot them? Um, it, it's obviously easy to be wise after the event, but I think that 
once one accepts that regimes like Lukashenko's are going to go after their enemies abroad, and we've seen that they do, um, then we have to reckon, well, we are in charge of these law governed spaces abroad and we, whether we're in government or out of government, we need to make sure that these people are protected. But anyway, let's let's move on. We can come back to this in, in, in the discussion, but thank you for kicking us off. And for anyone who hasn't seen this wonderful documentary that you've done about Gongadze, um, there's a link to it um, in the chat on this soon. Um, but I want to go um, next to Georg and give us a perspective from the European Union. It must be very frustrating um, for you sitting in Brussels and seeing this disaster unfolding um, in a plane that was going from one EU capital to another, but it's just temporarily outside EU airspace. Um, give, give, give us your perspective, Georg. No, indeed. Uh, thank you very much. So maybe before we go into that, let's, let's remind that, that in EU member states, we also had murder cases very similar, like, like Gongadze. I mean, 2017, the Maltese investigative journalist, the Davne Korana Galizia, and then one year later, only in, in Slovakia, Jan Kuciak and his fiancée, Martina Kutnerova. So, so this, uh, this was, uh, let's say, this is a serious, and this is happening uh, uh, also, uh, also within the EU. And the issue which was just uh, mentioned, uh, there have been people brought to trial, uh, the, the people that killed Jan Kuczak and his fiancé, uh, the person, it's such they are in prison, but uh, what was not possible for, for, the, for the court, uh, we have to respect the court, uh, was to uh, convict the, the ones that possibly have given the order to do that and maybe have paid for that. So, so I think something Natalia said in the beginning, uh, impunity is something which, uh, which allows for more. Actually, impunity is something that encourages for, for more acts like this. And that's why it is so extremely important to, uh, to, to bring uh, those uh, people and starting with, with physical aggression. And uh, also in Ukraine, I mean, there, there are, we had like 200 cases, I think 170 of physical aggression in, in, the, in the areas controlled by the government. I'm not speaking about the non-controlled areas where there is no freedom, freedom of speech. So, so what is important is to, to immediately react, uh, uh, not just for murder cases, with each act of aggression, to, 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 to have the prosecutors prosecuted, to, to investigate, etc. And what we, what we notice is that, that very often uh, investigations start, but then all of a sudden they end and they are not successful. And not many people are brought to justice. And, and, and in, in this sense, uh, we have this phenomenon of impunity. Yes, yesterday, of course, this was uh, an unprecedented uh, shock, uh, an unprecedented act of uh, state terrorism, as it has been called. It was uh, something uh, unprecedented. And we had uh, the European Council last night a gathering uh, to discuss the relations with Russia, and, and this came in. So, so, of course, immediately the European Council, our leaders, they, they, they of course, not only condemned this act, but they, they, the further sanctions are, are going to follow. And, of course, any uh, support package which we we, 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 we were preparing for, for the case, of course, of a democratic change in Belarus. This is now even further away than, than ever before, unless, unless this turns out to be a boomerang. When I, when I heard about it yesterday, I thought, and that's sometimes what happened, that maybe this is now just going one step too far. Maybe this is a step that can turn the page towards a more democratic. Uh, uh, Belarus. This is, of course, at least our hope. And we from the EU side and our president uh, von der Leyen, she was very strong yesterday in saying that we will not give up until, until there is freedom of speech, until there is freedom of association, until democracy will prevail in, in, in Belarus. So, so I think for, for us as EU, this is an incentive uh, to, to do more, to support more. We, we have now basically uh, completely uh, stopped our, 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 our interaction with the government in the sense of any kind of assistance. What we are doing instead is assisting civil society organizations, uh, independent organizations, uh, trying to, to make them stronger to, to fight for, for democracy. And of course, some of them, is in, unfortunately, are in diaspora now. They are, for example, in Vilnius. Uh, uh, and, and, and of course, the, the, we, we are doing our best to, uh, to, to, to help. So over to you. This is just first impressions. Well, thanks very much indeed for that, Georg, and for reminding us of Daphne Caruana Galizia. And I should say, actually, there's been an even more recent case of Georgios uh, Caravaz in Greece, a leading in Greek investigative journalist who specialised in um, organised crime. And he was killed um, just uh, last month on the 9th of April in what looks like a contract killing. And thanks also for pointing out that again and again, 
when we have these investigations and Anna Politkovskaya's murder also comes to mind, it's quite common that you find the hitman, um, the guy who pulled the trigger. What you don't find is who gave the order to pull the trigger. And there the investigations all too often um, run into the ground. Um, but you mentioned the terrible case in um, Slovakia. So I'm going to go straight over to Rasto Kozel. Um, Rasto, um, though nothing would, um, you know, can, can undo the, the tragedy of that, of that murder, it did have a galvanizing effect on Slovak civil society. And um, Jan's memory is honored by the kind of you know, political sea change that there's been, there's been since then, I suppose. Absolutely. And um, uh, thanks a lot uh, for the invitation uh, to participate. It's really an honor uh, to be here and to discuss these important issues. Uh, clearly, um, I think um, in terms of, uh, of Jan's uh, and Martina's uh, uh, murder, it, it had really a huge impact on, on society. And, and to an extent, uh, one could say that uh, those perpetrators achieved exactly the opposite. If, if the main message was to, you know, to, to, to send um, uh, some, uh, you know, shockwaves and, and to, to actually give some warning uh, to those who were uh, willing to investigate, uh, uh, then I think uh, it, 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 what, what, what happened in response was exactly the opposite. I mean, the, the journalists really united and, and, uh, and also um, civil society. Uh, young people uh, went to streets uh, to demonstrate, to protest. So that was really something which um, which uh, which was really unprecedented. Uh, I mean, as was the murder uh, here in Slovakia. Uh, but uh, to look at uh, maybe some uh, some parallels and and maybe to, to elaborate a little bit also. First of all, uh, congratulations to Natalia for excellent uh, documentary. I actually. Uh, worked in Ukraine. I started working there in 1999, so I am actually uh, familiar uh, with the environment uh, to an extent. And and um, and exactly, I mean, what what uh, what uh, you Edward mentioned already that uh, the hitmen uh, usually are found, but not those uh, who order, as as it seems to be also the the the. the, the although here in in Slovakia, I think. Uh, you know, uh, obviously we are still waiting for the for the court decision, but uh, but I think many of us uh, I think already already believe that uh, that we know uh, quite a bit about uh, the background of this case. But um, exactly as the as the documentary shows, uh, the it, what what came very well out of the documentary is the unwillingness of the authorities to actually uh, you know finish the investigation and and to go all the way up. Uh, and, and we may never find out, uh, you know, for sure. I mean, who who was actually the one who uh, who ordered the killing? Even though, again, there there could be very strong indications. And I think this is uh, what is very important to mention: the the penetration of state, and and the way uh, how particularly the you know the the secret service uh, is used against uh, the opponents, against uh, journalists. I mean, if, if I look at the most recent case of, of Raman, I think, uh, you know, uh, again, I mean, we still need to wait uh, until we have uh, full information, but, but it's very likely that, uh, you know, KGB has been involved. And, and I think, uh, you know, you mentioned that a lot of uh, people are currently in exile in diaspora. And, and if there is one message, I think, which the regime wanted to send was that, uh, you are not safe wherever you are. You know we can we can we can come and get you, which, which I think is is very a very strong uh, message. And and I think this is exactly and it was mentioned. You know the cultural impunity. I think this is where we need to see action, like demonstrated, for example, by the Slovak journalists. You know who actually came together, issued a statement in solidarity with Raman. I think we need this sort of sign of solidarity. This is what. Uh, what is really effective, in my view, uh, what about the, the same way as, so, as solidarity by the EU uh, countries? You know, uh, we are talking about sanctions. I'm sure that we will be discussing all this maybe a little bit later, but this is the point I wanted to make uh, that solidarity is extremely important in, in these sort of cases. Maybe I will stop here and then happy to answer any questions later. Yes, th thanks so much for that. Uh, um... 
uh, right still, and particularly, I think Anne Applebaum made this point in a, a, a column she just wrote for the Atlantic Monthly, that what we're seeing is the the repressive regimes now acting with impunity beyond their borders. It's not just the Belarusians, the Russians, the Chinese with their um, kidnapping, the Iranians with their hit squads, um, the Saudis, as we saw with Khashoggi. It's become you know, what we used to think was there was a kind of safe space, which is you know, Western countries and the sort of dangerous space, which is sort of Russia or wherever. But the, um, the ability of whether it's organized crime groups or kleptocracies um, to go after their um, opponents all around the world and get away with it is 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 a real game changer because it starts chilling people's um, willingness to engage in um, free media even in free societies. But um, Maria, let me let me come to you um, next at the end of our first round and give us your analytical and indeed personal perspective on 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 what's happening and perhaps maybe point us a bit in the direction of what we should be what we should be doing about it. Well, thank you, Edward. Thank you, everyone. Being a Belarusian is really tough these days. Every half a year, world media remember about Belarus, or sometimes every five years, and then they just lose attention and interest for the next period. So in a way, it shows that it's not only the immediate reaction is uh, something that is important, because when something really happens, like a plane hijacking, like a big wave of protests. The whole world's attention is focused on you. But what is happening in between is even more important. This whole plane incident could not have been possible if for the last 10 months, the Belarusian regime would not be destroying systematically day by day, the whole free media scene that has been remaining in Belarus. Very often we hear the political statements, including by the European institutions that say in general about rule of law and human rights and political dissidents and opponents, and they fail even to mention that uh, more than 500 journalists, I think right now since August, have been victims of repressions, that 34 journalists are currently behind the bars, that the biggest portal with 3.8 million daily users to the .by is now under criminal investigation. And as we speak, the whereabouts of three more people from this newsroom is unknown. They were taken away by unknown people to some minibuses and their relatives don't know what's happening with them. And their only crime is running social media networks of this portal. So the fact that the world turned attention to something as drastic as the plane forced landing in Belarus still kind of hides the background that is happening there, that the regime thinks it can allow itself doing so because it has done already so many other things which were reacted to either by the threat of fourth package of sanctions, which has been discussed for a while. I'm not speaking if they're efficient or not, but we know also how individual governments, the ones that are now supporting so much and strongly the Savage case, were the one to most actively cross out some names and businesses from the sanction lists, you know, uh, because they wanted to keep business relations with the regime. Or basically by saying, well, we support civil society and independent media, which is, of course, very important, but it doesn't really help the ones who stay there. Right now, I think the reaction of the European Union, although it's very commendable that fortunately the Council was happening just on these days, and it managed to really go strong and in a united voice, de facto is leaving hundreds of journalists without a possibility to leave Belarus right now, to flee for refugee, because this immediate decision of certain member states to stop any flights to and from Belarus leave the only way of escaping the country blocked. The land border has been limited by the Belarusian government back in November due to COVID restrictions. People cannot leave Belarus if they do not have a valid reason, such as job contracts in a European country, for example. And the airspace was the only way for people to escape. So I know for sure that some group of people non-related to Pratasevich case who were planning to fly to Europe yesterday and today and tomorrow, today they can't just because the reaction was so harsh, so swift, and it was decided that the whole incident is about airspace and not about press freedom. Of course, it's tragic that the airspace and civilian aviation has been hurt so much. But I think what we need structurally for these cases is thinking how to ensure that the overall environment for press freedom, that the overall 
journalistic community or dissident community is supported in a more holistic and comprehensive way. Uh, Edward, you mentioned the safety net in Europe and that something needs to be done indeed, maybe should have been done in Greece to support Pratasevich, but also something has to be done to support these Chechen bloggers that have been nearly murdered in Sweden or in Germany, right? Because another autocratic ruler decides that uh, his regime can kill them or attempt to kill them all over the European Union. Something has to be done about the kidnapping of Afghan Mukhtarli, an Azeri journalist who find refuge, found refuge in Georgia and then was kidnapped from there by Azeri secret services, possibly with the help of the Georgian secret services. So the whole issue of the safety net for those who managed to escape, I think is indeed something that the European structures could do something more about because unlike inside Belarus, they have much more leverage and possibility both inside the European Union states and the European neighborhood states to make sure that these file standards are uh, fulfilled. And last but not least, I think the international coalitions to fight impunity against especially cold cases are a must. We as Free Press Unlimited run this project together with Committee to Protect uh, Journalists and Reporters Without Borders, which is called Safer World for the Truth, which is building the so-called People's Tribunal to actually investigate and bring to light the cold, uninvestigated murder cases of journalists. And we think the more such coalitions appear, the more governments help and the more international institution help, the better it will be for the security of journalists. And also maybe it will bring justice to such cases as Gongatze. Well, thanks so much, Maria. That was both thought provoking and very moving. And um, at this point, I did, uh, you, you mentioned this in the chat before we actually started broadcasting, but I think it's really important to remember that Lukashenko got away with this more than 20 years ago, it was 1999. Um, that his political opponents were into, uh, into, into Southend, into Southend, yeah. and actually Dmitry Zavatsky, he was 27 only when he disappeared. Yes. He was more well, you, or less the age of Roman Pratasevich right now. Exactly. So, I mean, in May 1999, Yuri Zakharenko was kidnapped. Now, he was a, he was the um, former Minister of Internal Affairs who'd stood up, um, st stood, st stood up to Lukashenko. So as early as, as, and that was what, 22 years ago. And then there was Viktor Hansha, Anatoly Kolosovsky, and Dmitry Zavadsky, um, the um, la last of them. Um, and you know, we could have done something then, and we, did, and we, and we didn't. So there's a, this, this, ha this has very deep roots. And the lesson that we've taught the Lukashenko regime is you can get away with this and we will be cross as you said the west focuses on Belarus sometimes every six months sometimes every five years um but the attention goes away and I think Rebecca Harms has just come up in the in the chat with an excellent it's not really a question but a point so I'll just um, um amplify it here which we were very lucky that the EU council was meeting at exactly this point it really forced them to take a stance. Now, uh, Maria, you pointed out that what they've done may be a sort of um, um, bear service, a uh, um, kiss, of, kiss of death for the people who wanted to leave Belarus and couldn't, but at least they, they did sort of react. But in a way, I think you know, what this really shows is the EU has failed over the last 20 years to deal with Belarus. They've created the environment in which Lukashenko thinks he can, um, thinks he can get away with that. Um, so I want to have one more round among the, the panelists about um, to try and cast a slightly more optimistic note of what 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 have we learned that works? What if you look back over the years, if Gongadze was still with us and he, he could see Europe now, both EU and non-EU Europe, what have we worked out that 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 is um, that is really effective? What would he be impressed by? What would he say that's a that's a really good thing? And I'll go to you. Um, Natalia first and let's try and keep the note positive in this round and then we'll get on to some questions from the audience which will take us back to the land of gloom. 
first of all, to keep it positive, I should always say it's not just a gloomy story. So we're focusing on that, that most of the investigation, uh, they are in the end, uh, at least happening to the level of a hitman, thanks to the coordination of the journalist. Uh, also, I shouldn't say that, you know, all kind of the concerns, letters and something are totally useless, because we know the cases when they are not even existing at all. So international attention matters. Um, and in case of Gongadze, in the end, you know, it won't help, but still there was a decision of the European Court for Human Rights, and she has the support to win this court against the um, Ukrainian state in uh, um, early 2000, which somehow managed to help her to settle down and, you know, grow up her, uh, you know, to, 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 that was not really helpful, but it was at least something. So I think like those basic infrastructure is needed, the support, uh, I'm giving another example um, that, for instance, in the case of the uh, Crimean Tatars, especially citizen journalists, because there is impossible to be a professional journalist in occupied Crimea today. So we have just Crimean Tatars. And there are for a couple of years already up to six of them charged with terrorism and extremism asleep as if they are kind of supporting any uh, Hizbut Tahrir or other organization. But in their case, there is very, very little, um, you know, um, concern, uh, letters, and uh, any kind of solidarity. Uh, so we sometimes even do not know what's happening to them. Uh, in case, for instance, of Stanislav Asyev, another Ukrainian journalist who was for, the t for some time in Donetsk under the, um, in the uh, kidnapped by the, uh, by, by the so-called local uh, uh, pro-Russian um, rebels. So, he managed to survive also because there was international attention to him. He has become famous. However, that's maybe in some of the cases how people to, let's say, survive. But in the end, they are not really freed because of the pressure of the West. In our case, so for instance, exchange to free some journalists in the occupied territories of Ukraine health, thanks uh, happened because of the government exchange, not because of some concern or sanctions. My idea still is that so far with that regimes are adjusting, um, you know, the red lines is moving. So something which was important, uh, and for instance, the call of the uh, you know U.S. president, as we had, for instance, in case of the uh, Barack Obama and freeing uh, Emin Mili in Azerbaijan, which was in end of uh, I think like in 2010 or so, that worked. Now it doesn't work any longer. Uh, you know. Uh, we see that uh, calls from President Macron to uh, President Putin to free somebody uh, among the Ukrainian political prisoners, among them there are journalists, they do not work. But personal sanctions against some of the uh, people and persecutors, they do work. Uh, so today that's the tool. Today such things like that Magnitsky Act and this are more, maybe something feasible, but I think there are two lines, something how to punish the particular individuals in the regimes. But the second, something which Maria stressed, I can't, I support everything Maria said, also regarding this um, stopping the flights. Um, the any kind of support, providing the support also for the people who are maybe not that famous, not forgetting them, making possible for them to survive if they do not have go on their career, uh, their families, these programs in countries like Belarus, Georgia, uh, Ukraine, Azerbaijan uh, might be very, very much critical. Or for instance, in case of the journalists who live in the uh, occupied Crimea. Uh, yeah. They are really needed. Yes, I, I, we, we haven't mentioned the case so far of Jessica Aro, the Finnish journalist who was attacked by the um, Russians for her um, very um, good investigative journalism about the troll factory in St. Petersburg. But that's really produced quite an impressive um, reaction in Finland, although she suffered very much. She had to leave Finland. But the Finns now take 
um, soft target protection very seriously. So if you're a journalist or a campaigner or an academic or someone in an NGO and you're dealing with it, mostly it'd be Russia, but it could also be China, whatever, um, you have a hotline. Um, if there's something that goes wrong, you get support from your employer, you get counselling, health insurance, legal help. Um, there's a dedicated police unit which is there to <coughs> deal with these cases. So you're not just left trying to, you know, sounding like some crazy person saying people are following me and I don't want to do about it. So I do think that there's, there's the, you know, the, the pushback after these things happen <coughs> can, can, can be quite positive. But let, let's just whiz around the panel uh, for some quick, quick thoughts on, um, on, on positive things. And then we'll go on to some questions from the um, audience. Um, Georg, what's the what's the best thing that's happened in the last five years from your point of view? No, I think uh, I, I wanted to share actually some some positive examples in the sense small steps but important steps to to increase the protection and to increase the awareness for uh, for for media freedom. Uh, what we are doing uh, together with the Council of Europe, we have been developing a uh, recommendation to improve legislation, uh, to make the uh, criminal court sharper, to develop guidance for judges, for prosecutors who, who, who sometimes uh, you know, have not enough sensitivity, not enough knowledge. We are organizing uh, together with the Ukrainian uh, Academy of Judges and other institutions training courses. We did it now under COVID times. We uh, had 100 judges uh, being trained uh, specifically on, on, on cases which are related to uh, freedom of press and, and, and aggression against journalists, etc. So these are some, you know, this is a, a, a long time work. Uh, you cannot change it from one day to another, but, but we, we put an emphasis uh, on, on that to, to increase this. Of course, uh, there are also cases uh, that have been decided by the European Court of Human Rights. Uh, there are eight cases which have not yet been implemented, uh, judgments uh, which are related to freedom of speech. So, so we are, of course, constantly reminding Ukraine that there's still work to be done, etc. So in that sense, I think there is, it's, a, it's, a, it's, a, it's a marathon uh, to, 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 to be followed, uh, but, but this is work ongoing. We are currently preparing, and we had actually this morning a, a long discussion about it, a big program to support independent media uh, in Ukraine, uh, but also to strengthen the public broadcaster. So, so we will come out with a, with a major project uh, probably to be implemented from next year on, uh, on, uh, on, uh, on, on supporting freedom of speech and, 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 and journalists in, in Ukraine. Over. I love the way that Zoom has taught us all to say over when we finish speaking. It has a, a very useful import from the military. And I, I also hear people saying Roger that, which always amuses me. Um, so um, let, let's go to Rast, 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 Rasto next. Um, and, um, and I was very impressed. Your, your website has a list of all the media organizations that are um, outraged, the, all the editors in chief were outraged by what's just happened in, in Belarus. But it did strike me um, the breadth and depth of the Slovak media is, is, is actually really encouraging. It was only a few years ago people were saying that the media is dying, it's being squeezed by oligarchic ownership and by pressure from the FITSO government, and you know, we're, we're really worried. And I just looked at that long list of news outlets and I thought, gosh, that's a, that's a, uh, that, that table's got a lot of food on it, I thought. Oh, exactly, and and this is uh, perhaps one <clears throat> one positive example of uh, of, uh, of 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 a response uh, uh, to this. But uh, I would also say that uh, each of these uh, journalists, each case that we are discussing, is actually on its own a, a very good inspiration. I mean, we see that uh, what is hitting uh, these autocrats uh, very hard is investigation of corruption. So uh, every single uh, brave journalist, I mean, who, who, who sort of reveals these schemes, who reveals the hypocrisy uh, by the West, you know, the, who follows the money. I mean, that's really uh, important thing because then it shows us why, why is it hurting uh, the autocrats, why they are responding in this way. The second category, you know, are journalists who are very creative because uh, Quite clearly, uh, and, and Yasha Mang put it uh, very well in, 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 in a recent article in, in the Foreign Affairs that uh, you know the story of the last two decades is not just the one of, uh, of democratic weakness, but it's also uh, the one of uh, authoritarian strength. And I think we have to recognize that uh, authoritarians really 
are learning from each other, are learning these methods. I mean, we discussed how they now uh, try to target uh, people outside of the borders. You know, there is clearly, you know, globalization in that sense, uh, if I can put it that way. And so what we need is really, I would say, global response. Uh, so in a way, look for these inspirational cases. I mean, uh, Jessica Aro, you know, investigating the Russian trolls and, and this sort of involvement in, in, in different uh, elections of, of, of other countries. Uh, and I think, uh, you know, this, this should uh, serve as, 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 as inspiration. And then I think what, uh, what is necessary is, uh, is unity. You know, uh, I mean, solidarity and unity, again, I mean, as, as demonstrated by, uh, because only this uh, could actually wake up society, as it did in Slovakia, uh, as clearly, you know, thanks to that uh, pressure, you know, the, 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 the previous government basically uh, resigned, you know, and, and, and this, I think, was something that you would not be able to imagine maybe a few years ago. And, and, and again, this sort of, as you pointed out, Edward, I mean, this sort of uh, response by different Slovak outlets, uh, you know, joining the cause, I think this is what, uh, what is necessary. This is, I think, the best response that we could, we could get uh, to such action. Good. Thanks so much for, for that, Rasto. And um, Maria, let's come to you last. And I, I'm, I mean, I, I'm, I'm horrified by, by what's happening at um, toot.by, and you've highlighted the squeeze on the independent media. But it, it also, it's a huge contrast from Belarus 15 or 20 years ago, when there wouldn't have been any independent media to squeeze. And I remember the, you know, the original days of, uh, I think it was called Radio Razia, of sort of very boring um, uh, programs on medium wave of sort of men with beards having silly arguments about history. And this feeling that you know, we, we weren't even getting, you know, there was no penetration of the Belarusian media space at all. We just couldn't, couldn't get um, through the fog of the Lukashenko propaganda machine. And that's actually been a, a, a huge change over the last 15 years, and although he may be able to crush some elements of it, he can't um, can't crush it all. Well, yeah, Edward, I'll switch to Belarus in a moment, especially because I was behind the station that challenged Radio Razzi and we created a new uh, internet savvy youth project called European Radio for Belarus, which is alive and kicking and is one of the most popular media outlets right now. And I think you're right. Indeed, the shift happened some 15 years ago when internet became more accessible. But first, let me say about some positive practices I noticed in the European Union. First of all, I think the European Democracy Action Plan and the initiatives on Creative Europe and communication audiovisual plans that are now applicable to the European Union states are crucially important. Everything that Commission Eurova is doing actually to catch up with these decades of neglection of media freedom gaps in certain EU member states is important not only for the health of these member states and the societies of Hungary, Poland, or maybe Slovenia, but also because through that the European Union is setting an example that it can do its homework when it comes to media freedom that the autocratic rulers cannot say, look at Orban, he just bought 200 media outlets. Why are you actually accusing me of some small market concentration? So I think this uh, decisive position of the European Union to start looking back home and to do something is important. And it's really important if the coherence between the DG Connect and DG Near is growing and that the external uh, policy actors actually uh, spread the best practices that are now done internally. And that can serve as a huge attraction factor to, I think, many members, not only member states, but candidate country or neighbors. But speaking of Belarus or some other societies, indeed, the development of internet and understanding you cannot censor certain things, like, for example, Telegram Messenger, which is basically protected against censorship. It has led the governments to understanding that blocking the internet is not enough. You can block it for three days maybe, but you're also blocking the work of your own websites and so on. And censoring them is a very cumbersome process. 
So the Belarusian Independent Association of Journalists and editors who stayed and continued working with the help of so many newsrooms around Europe, actually, which showed tremendous solidarity, managed to create a very professional independent journalism sector, which was key to actually world coverage of the protests last year. These world media were relying on verifiable, trustworthy networks of stringers, fixers, and local media inside Belarus. It is therefore even more crucially important to not allow the regime to crush this sector. One, two journalists, yes, we all cry for them. We understand it's so cruel to torture someone and to really beat up maybe some confessions. But if you destroy the whole media sector, then it will be a serious situation. It will be Eritrea situation. It will be a situation when we will have to build the new platform for people to get independent, trustworthy information for decades. And therefore, coming back to it, yes, Belarusian did a good job to keep and retain and find very many innovative ways to do quality journalism product. And one of the ways would, to support them would be, even if they have to move abroad temporarily, to make sure that the diversity of this media scene is preserved. I know there is a discussion going on between decision makers whether diaspora media or diaspora organizations should be supported or in this way we're kind of, you know, stimulating people to leave Belarus. But I think for now, the main goal would be to actually make sure that quality independent media and journalists in Belarus are able to continue their work from every part of the world because indeed internet connects people. Thanks. Thanks very much for, for that. Can I add maybe a good bit on, on, on Maria's, this question about the diaspora journalists. Of course, why it's, it's also important. It depends from country and country. I remember, you know, also the talk of the journalists who moved from Raqqa at the time of ISIS, Syrian journalists, whose then founder had been assassinated in Gaziantep, they moved to Turkey, then they moved to Berlin, but they also had uh, not very easy life because they ha had been e from Raqqa. So, uh, and in their case, their job was still possible and there was uh, no way to work there. Uh, in case of Ukraine or some other countries, there is always the, uh, the chance that you may stay there, you may be outside, but I think that the resources should be somehow divided. There is a moment in the country when you cannot stay. There is a moment when for some people it's very difficult to stay and for some people it's possible. So that shouldn't be one, let's say, policy. Of course, people today appreciate a lot the journalists who are in their towns in their cities but some job uh, especially investigative job can be today done done like Bellingcat you know you can and or what's now uh, done uh, Navalny they can be done from outside with satellites with with some stringers so I do think for European Union and for everybody uh, we, we should be that both things are necessary and uh, should be you know supported. Well, we're, we're, amazingly, we are almost out of time. We've got about 10 minutes left. It's, um, we could probably go on for hours. But um, there's one thing I particularly want to just drill down on, which is the kind of dilemma of being a, a, a journalist um, when you're dealing with a kleptocracy or an authoritarian country, and how you keep your sort of journalistic independence while at the same time um, you know, fighting um, to protect it. And there's, there's quite a dilemma here. And I think that um, you know, we, um, we, we've seen this very clearly with, um, actually with, with Roman, that he was um, you know, both a, and, and there's, uh, there's interviews with him where he sort of reflects on this dilemma that he's both campaigning against the regime and he's a, you know, he's, he's, he's a campaigner and a sort of quasi politician, um, but he's also, he's also a journalist and a blogger. And it's not, there's, there's not a neat dividing line. Um, but there, but it, this does this sort of double hatting does create problems that your campaign your your campaigning um, activity puts you more in the firing line. Um, perhaps even though not campaigning doesn't keep you out of the firing line. And so I'd, I'd like to ask um, the panelists all just to reflect on this dilemma about how far do 
um, can independent journalism go in campaigning while still remaining its uh, re 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 retaining its independence? And we might go in reverse order this time. So I'll go to you, um, Maria, first as the um, Belarusian on the panel to reflect on that. And then we'll come back and wind up um, in time to stop at uh, um, on on the hour. Also, as a Polish on the panel, I probably can reflect the best of the two countries <laughs> I've been. Uh, I would say that uh, the diversity of market is, again, the argument I would want to uh, put here. I mean, you live in a country where some of the media are hugely politicized and campaigning against certain things, and some media are more balanced and prefer to uh, fulfill the public service broadcast role. And this should not be different for Belarus or Ukraine or some others, as long as borders are clear. Unfortunately, sometimes in our well wishing, we think that, oh, if we could just have created a perfect media market where all the media are just following the single set of editorial standards and really do no harm policy and so on. No, well, unfortunately, this is against the human nature. So every journalist and every media outlet should decide for themselves how much they want to be politically citing with opposition or certain values and how much they want to stay away or at least, but the main thing, they should recognize their bias. If we apply this universal approach of journalism to the countries with uh, problems in the journalism and where we see the journalists are persecuted, then I think it will be easier for us to always see if this outlet of this journalist were clear about their goals and intentions and didn't do information manipulation or other things, then they're ours, right? We need to stand firmly to protect them despite whatever roles they are. But I saw the question also in the chat that what happens if you are sometimes punishing some trolls or propagandists and then you get criticized by Council of Europe of not fulfilling their rights to do journalism in your country, which is of course Russian trolls in Ukraine, I would be very interested to think, to hear what others think, like what do we do in that situation? Well, we'll I think hand that one to Natalia, um, at how do you fight the trolls and the Russians while at the same time maintaining um, the media freedom, but you'll come to that at the end. But let me go to you next, Georg, because it's a, it's a difficult one for you because the European Commission um, doesn't want to take sides in a party political sense. Yet, independent journalism in itself is actually, um, a, in, in, in some circumstances, not least actually inside the European Union um, nowadays with Hungary, is in itself a kind of political, um, a political action. So how, how, how do you square that circle? I think I, I was posted once uh, in, in Warsaw, and uh, uh, I think one of the mottos of Gazeta Wyborcza was, uh, in Polish it sounds, nam ne wszystko jedno, and this means uh, we are not indifferent. Uh, so I mean, uh, that means that, that, that this newspaper, which is the, the biggest newspaper in Poland, feels a mission. I mean, in, it's not just kind of objectively reporting, but it also has kind of a mission and it, it has a lot of opinion articles in that sense. And this is not uh, exclusive. I mean, you can, that's why you have OPET, you know, that's why you have uh, objective reporting. You can have both in, in, as, as a media. You can also have a cause and you can also fight for something. I think there is not a, I wouldn't see this as a contradiction necessarily. Uh, I think when, when it comes to Ukraine, what, what we very much value is, is the diversity. I think Maria mentioned that before. Diversity basically is, is, is a key uh, also of, of making it much more difficult to, 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 to suppress uh, uh, media. And diversity means within the country, but diversity may also mean, and we just discussed that, that you have, you have diaspora uh, uh, helping. And with the internet, of course, the difference is not so, so, so big anymore. And I, I, I remember uh, uh, having been as a student in still communist Poland, I, I, I knew about the, all the Paris based uh, um, uh, editing houses uh, that, that were extremely important, had a lot of influence from the diaspora on, on what was happening in Poland. And one smuggled the little miniatures uh, books from Solzhenitsyn and others. So it means in that sense, I think this is also still true today. So, but, but with other means, technolo technologically, we are of course more, more advanced and the internet gives us huge possibilities. So, so, I, so I, would, I, would, I would not see it as a contradiction, but uh, what, what we try to do, and that's why diversity is important, we try to support not just one option, et cetera. We try to support uh, a diversity of, of journalists, diversity of, 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 of NGOs, uh, uh, in this, we we have given a, a big grant to in, endowment, European Endowment for Democracy, 
as a kind of helping us to 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 distribute also grant money uh, where where it's really needed, etc. So in that sense, I think this is how we we try to support uh, uh, diversity and and also in in a way values. I mean, it's because uh, the Ukrainian media, if we see them, I mean they they also carry values, and in that sense. I think we, we want to promote these values by, by, by supporting them. Thanks so much, Georg. And um, Rastil, over to you, either on, on that question, which I posed, or if you want to pick up, there's some good questions in the chat from um, Irina um, Matvechuk and from Tadej uh, Kshivta. If you wanted to answer one of those, um, welcome, welcome to do that. But um, we're happy to hear anything you have to say. Sure. Now, I think uh, what you asked uh, is an excellent question and, uh, and indeed uh, not such an easy one uh, to, to, to respond without uh, basically looking uh, deeper uh, in, into the essence of this. Uh, and, and, uh, but um, my, my point is, is it's, it's really a question of, of, uh, of values. It's a question of credibility. It's a question of not fighting uh, propaganda with anti-propaganda, because that's, I think, exactly what those propagandists want to, want, want to achieve. And so whenever I'm asked that question uh, in Ukraine, uh, you know, I, I always try to, uh, to, to point out at, um, you know, what I think what, what the, the regime in Kremlin fears most is, um, is, is vibrant uh, society, you know, which is well informed and, and which is actually doing some real progress uh, in terms of democracy and, and, and sort of uh, join European values. And, and this is uh, exactly why the Ukrainians, uh, you know, uh, were against, um, you know, this, uh, this uh, proposal to, uh, which was uh, sort of uh, pushed by Yanukovych. Uh, that's why they uh, protested. And, and this is, I think, what should uh, remain, uh, you know, at, at our focus that this is, in my view, the best response. I mean, the best response to sort of disinformation is good quality journalism. It's a credible journalism, which is based on, on, on values. Yes, sometimes it's much easier, uh, you know, to, to fight uh, the enemy with the same uh, sort of uh, tactics and, and with the same uh, type of uh, propaganda. And if we are in a, in a war, obviously, uh, you know, the line is pushed, uh, that is clear. But, but the essence should stay that, uh, you know, I mean, there are certain core values that we believe in. Uh, there are certain core values that, that, that form uh, the, the sort of European tradition of journalism. And I do believe that, uh, that we should try to uh, stick to those. Thanks so much. And um, Natalia, last word um, to you. There's been a good question about Ukraine's low ranking in media freedom, freedom indices because of the um, tough approach the authorities take to Russian propaganda channels. Um, if you wanted to reflect on, on, on that, it'd be very interesting to hear your, um, uh, and also banning visas for so-called journalists and Russian state TV channels. Um, if you want to reflect on that or indeed um, anything else, um, wind us up with this excellent discussion. I would round up with, you know, the, the, somehow the war question. Um, so, uh, th and the, the question you, you, you asked to everybody in this final round. Um, our organization, my organization, is working how to overcome polarization and partisanship. But answering your question, I should say, partisanship isn't a crime, isn't something for being kidnapped, killed, or uh, arrested. So I do think we need to differentiate. Also in this regard with the trolls and banning the people on the social media, I do think it's very dangerous to compare. Uh, of course, we need to demand radical transparency on also on trolls, bots, how algorithms are done. There are other discussions. P Peter Pomerantsev is writing a lot how we can define trolls, how we can have you know the rules whom we consider the troll and whom we consider a legit journalist. However, still, um, in the case, I'm honestly, I'm not, I'm really against silencing opinions. If there are legit opinions of different people, not trolls, even if the opinions, I disagree. The difference is with the hate crime and some other things. So in this regard, I think this is a thin line and we should be very cautious about silencing opinion in the uh, post-Soviet world uh, due to all the traumas we had before. But uh, still it is not, 
uh, uh, kidnapping or arrest as it might happen. Uh, yet, I should say that uh, I'm very happy that in Ukraine today, uh, for the last decade almost, we almost never use the term opposition media. It was 20 years ago. It's not existing any longer. Uh, and that is very important. And despite, uh, of course, the investigative journalism are on the front line, they are under the threat. But I also know that the regimes, they are also very much afraid of the uh, legit newsrooms who are balanced, who are quality, because those newsrooms can speak outside of the bubble of the people they can mobilize. Those people can be maybe more trusted and talk to the audience, uh, which not just agreeing on the, uh, you know, what, what you say. So both risks are there. Um, par uh, and as I said, we, the partisanship is a different thing. The most important today is a transparency of the opinions, transparency of your bias. Uh, but to end up, you mentioned Gazeta Viborcha. I remember the, uh, also the great interview with uh, Adam Michnik, who in the end said, the truth is not in between. The truth is where it is. Uh, so in a way, we are professionally can define, uh, you know, this, this nuance. And uh, with that, I want to thank everybody to, to this discussion and to, to really understand uh, how it is. A, this is a matter, of course, for many people of the life and death, uh, but also it's a matter of the generally building the, the, the stable de democracy in the long run. Wow, well, thanks so much. The time has gone, it was an hour and it seems like five minutes. And um, I want to thank, um, first of all, um, the dozens of people who've been watching on um, Zoom from all over all over the place. I see many um, friends and colleagues um, on the um, list of attendees, so thank you all for taking the time. Um, and I also want to thank our panelists, um, Natalia, Maria, Georg and Brasto for, for, the, for their time. I want to urge everybody to watch the documentary and um, we can't bring um, Georgi Gongadze is back to life, but we can make sure he's not forgotten. So when you've watched the doc documentary, get your friends to watch it, share it on social media. Um, the people who killed him wanted to shut him up. Let's make sure that they, they don't succeed. And thank you, SIPA, for hosting this. We will be back with um, more discussions on these and other issues in the days, weeks and months ahead. And let's hope that we have something slightly more cheerful to talk about next time. Goodbye.